to the AA. He was here, I guess it was about four years ago, um, when his book, Designing Information Technology in the Postmodern Age, From Method to Meta Metaphor, uh, was published. Um, and I think the book um, was a very important contribution to the discussion of all the contemporary literature on information technology and computerization, not least uh, because of its rigorous skepticism about some of the claims. Um, and uh, I must say, as a kind of technological anti-diluvian, uh, I found this kind of extremely kind of pleasurable. Um, he's back here today, uh, and we welcome him to really give an account or a talk based upon the new book, which is being published by MIT, uh, which is called Techno Romanticism, uh, whose subtitle is Digital Narrative, Holism, and the Romance of the Real. In the book, what he does is to take a kind of highly kind of critical look at what he characterizes as the romantic legacy. The romantic legacy that pervades discourses um, about information technology. Uh, and I know looking around the room uh, that there are one or two other people kind of concerned with precisely that same problem. Within that, he kind of interrogates the fantasies uh, about information technology and about the possibilities of computerization um, by referring to, in effect, a wide range of 20th century resources um, of phenomenology, uh, of various forms of philosophy, uh, which in a sense had actually been in the first text uh, what, what's added into the second text um, is an engagement with surrealism uh, and with Lacanian psychoanalysis, uh, which I really look forward to hearing. It's a great pleasure to welcome him back uh, to the AA. And in a way, I, I hope that this year um, you don't just contribute a uh, uh, kind of pedagogical lecture, but also I hope that we can find a way of kind of enabling you to intervene in some of the techno-romanticism uh, which is currently organizing the AA itself. <laughs> Richard Clint, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Okay, may maybe it's my job then to sniff out techno-romanticism wherever I see it and, and put things to right. Um, the, the book is clearly too much to deal with in, in one short lecture, but um, perhaps I can broach the issues by referring not so much directly to techno-romanticism or the romantic legacy as the issues of the body. That may, may give us a key into some of the issues raised in the book. Um, as, well, as well as researching... Uh, and, and engaging in, in book projects. Um, I'm also concerned with uh, teaching at a very practical level, um, the use of information technology computing in the design studio. So I'm very much engaged um, with students um, at, at, at the base level of working in the studio. And generally when I set up a computer program, a, a course that involves the use of the computer in architecture, I try and think of a third term, some other issue which you could inject into the studio that brings alive the relationship between the computer and architecture. 
And perhaps you might have gathered from the title of my talk, um, th that element, that third element in this case, and for the last few years, has been the body. The body somehow intervenes between the issues to do with com the, the computer and issues to do with architecture. So really the purpose of this talk is to test a thesis, and the thesis is simply that uh, we can better understand architecture perhaps, uh, computing certainly, and the body maybe, uh, by considering this trilogy, this set of relationships. I guess uh, the body and, the, and architecture have been related uh, over many, many, many years through notions of proportion and geometry and, of course, symbol and metaphor and analogy. So we know about how um, the body and architecture have been variously related. Um, the body and the computer have also been related, perhaps through two narratives. Um, one narrative, uh, as Mar and Mark has alluded to this perhaps, uh, is, is a fairly critical sort of narrative, suggesting that um, the computer represents perhaps the final phases in this dreadful traje trajectory of technology and, and architecture with it, uh, whereby um, with Cartesianism everything's been reduced to a grid, to notions of objects somehow out there. Um, it's it's uh, perhaps been realised through modernism, but then there's been this more recent demise uh, through uh, computerization. So there's this technologization. Um, uh, some perhaps disembodiment that's occurring, some alienation from uh, our normal concerns. It's been realized through computing. So th the computer uh, implicates the body in so far as we construct this narrative where we're very critical of the computer. Now th these images were some of which were put together for another purpose, particularly to address some colleagues in Edinburgh. Um, what we have here is an image from um, the Patrick Geddes collection of, uh, of photographs from early the century of parts of um, Edinburgh, the, the wonderful new town, the Georgian new town. And certainly uh, one can scrutinise these old photographs and, and perhaps once we look past the dinginess of the imagery, um, see there a very precious, uh, wonderful set of architectural interventions um, and, and lament the fact that we're somehow losing this in, in with contemporary architecture and so on. There's an engagement with materials. There's a relationship between scale and, um, and the human and the body and so on. So that's one of these um, narratives that's been spun around the computer is that we're actually moving away from that and the computer is, is taking us further from uh, engagement of, of body proportions and so on and architecture. But I guess the other narrative that's being spun at the same time and the two are perhaps two sides of the same coin, they're perhaps in antagonism, but they both seem to feed off each other. And that, that is that there's all sorts of promise suggested by information technology, by the computer. So as you move into the realm of virtual reality, um, that's uh, all to do with bodily immersion. So we're getting uh, to a situation where we're able to immerse our bodies, our whole being, into some sort of world which is created digitally. And that's somehow body enhancing. It's to do with uh, returning to the body. So there are these two narratives which are in antagonism and one could actually pr present a talk or write a book which adopts either and you see journalists doing this all the time. You perhaps as they begin their, um, their, their article, they think now today should I be for or against technology? Should I be in favour of it, um, the embodiment of technology or should I say how in fact technology is alienating? Okay, well I want to try and move past that dichotomy um, and look at other ways that uh, the body is implicated in IT and architecture. And I'm going to do that by considering three issues which are interrelated. One is the way IT, or the, the narratives we construct about IT, um, talk about reconfiguring the, the sensorium, about how our senses are adjusted. Uh, then secondly, look at repetition and how the computer is implicated in notions of repetition. And then thirdly, the issue of attitude, which is after all to do with the body and orientation and attitude. Um, okay, so we have uh, some images here which uh, are suggesting notions of immersion, but of course we can see that the way the human body is depicted in these computer worlds is incredibly impoverished. Um, and also issues of the senses that, uh, sure, we can be immersed in, in a new sensory environment, the senses can be heightened, but uh, it's, it's an impoverished kind of operation. We have to plug ourselves into the machine in certain ways. But perhaps, as you see by that last slide. There are notions of the virtual body. There is a, a whole narrative that suggests that uh, things are being improved somehow. We're able to plant our bodies into these new environments. Now, 
one of my arguments in the book is that much of the rhetoric, much of the narrative about IT is harking back to good old-fashioned romanticism and even the arts and crafts movement. And as I seem to recall four years ago when I talked here, I, I alluded to the, the legacy of the arts and crafts movement as a romantic movement and how it's impinged on the way people think about computers. Um, but I just want to uh, come back to that shortly. Um, let's just consider uh, what's going on in this, um, in this kind of narrative. Um, the, the whole issue of the reconfiguration of the sensorium. It was Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s who uh, suggested that um, we're in fact now moving into a re-understanding re or reappropriation of the sense of hearing. It's the audile sense, the audial sense, the, the ear is the dominant organ. And the way his narrative runs is that prior to literacy, um, we were in a world where uh, the tribe ruled where there was an immediacy uh, in our contacts with one another. There's also an, an immediacy in engagement with our environment, so that uh, we were one with the forest or one with the plain. We were one with each other. There was a kind of a unity uh, in, in play. And we were constantly listening to the sounds of the forest or the plain. Uh, we were constantly listening to one another. We were constantly speaking. So sound was the operative sense. Um, now, for McLuhan, that was a, an ideal age. It was an age of unity, and s certainly when we reflect on the notion of sound, we tend to think, well, sound doesn't really suggest direction very often. We can be immersed in sound. We, we are immersed in music. There are various metaphors we use for describing sound which suggest some notion of unity and wholeness. Now, for McLuhan, then, um, taking an incredibly broad brush of, of, of sweep of history, um, with literacy... Uh, first of all, writing, and then with the invention of uh, the printing press, uh, then the eye began to take over, and quite simply by virtue of the fact that now we're reading, we're looking at text, we're looking at communication. So we're one removed from the immediacy of listening and from speaking. Um, so the ear gave way to the eye with, with the culture of literacy. And of course, according to McLuhan, this... Uh, evoked notions of objectivity, of distance. So we stand apart from things to look at them. We take a perspective, we take a view. And of course we take the master view, the overall view, so we lay things out. And so emerged the notion of objectivity and objectivism. Um, now for McLuhan, there was some inevitability in this transition from the ear to the eye. Uh, it was a transition from a, a state of wholeness, of being one with each other and with nature and our environment, to a state where things are individuated, they're separated, they're pulled apart. But then with the introduction of electronic communications, as it was in the 1960s, McLuhan uh, saw the prospect of a re-engagement with the sense of hearing. So there's a sense of return. So we're going back to the immediacy of hearing. And how does he construct this argument? Well, there is the notion, of course, in the 60s of the tribe. So there's a sense of getting <coughs> back, back to basic community um, there's a, a sense of uh, uh, breaking away from hierarchies. Also, in the case of the technology, there's a sense of, of being immersed in this constant babble of electronic communications where television sets are blaring all the time and the radio is constantly bombarding us. And so McLuhan, it was a, a case of going back to tribal culture. But of course, this time, it's a tribal culture transformed and we're going back with our eyes open. So that's McLuhan's perhaps big point that We've gone through this transformation from ear to eye, and now we're going back to the ear, but the ear transformed and illuminated by a sense of sight. So that's a very simple um, utopian dream, if you like. It's a, it's, it's a very basic utopian form, where there's some um, ideal state of grace, uh, then there's some sort of fall, a removal from that state, and then one day we expect and hope to return to that uh, original state of grace very simple cycle. And that's a, a recurring theme in all sorts of writing and philosophy. Uh, it's a theme that also um, John Dewey developed, um, uh, the notion of the ear transforming to the eye and then getting back to the ear somehow. So we have here utopian notions, and of course they're realised in much of the rhetoric about information technology. The idea of the global village, um, the use of a term like village, it suggests that uh, it could have said, the term could have been global tribe, perhaps. There is a sense that we're getting back to something that's uh, pre-civilization. Um, 
now with electronic communications and the internet and so on, we're all interconnected. So there's an immediacy of engagement with one another. The whole world is a village or a tribe. Also, there's a sense that we can get back to craft values. And um, this is a theme I explored in, in the, la the last talk I gave here and, and in various other writings. So there's a kind of uh, craft aesthetic that imbues much of IT narrative and culture. So, for example, um, the wonderful computer game Riven, uh, which I'm proud to say I've played right through to one of its many endings. Um, uh, w when the game was being uh, created, um, certain elements from that game were broadcast on the World Wide Web. So you could actually see these wondrous, uh, well-rendered, three-dimensional objects. There was a kind of craft uh, fetish going on with, with these elements. And we had the impression, uh, those who were looking forward to the game actually being released, that um, th there was this guild of, of, of skilled craftspeople carefully crafting these, uh, these objects. But of course also this mythology pervades through uh, IT culture. Um, I think I might have a picture of Bill Gates at some stage um, explaining how um, in, his, uh, in his book, uh, The Road Ahead, uh, we'll get back to it eventually, um, there was the notion of um, well, his, ha his wonderful mansion that he was building by a lake amongst the trees and of course the space, the entranceway for uh, the bicycles to be parked. And so what one finds in this IT world of, of big business and so on, there is in fact um, a, a tendency to at least aspire to return to something uh, natural that's somehow at variance with the, the IT world. Um, and also, of course, there are the uh, reputed craft origins of information technology. So Steve Jobs and, and even Gates and others um, began uh, small uh, with small backyard businesses or garage businesses which later grew and developed to these huge empires. So there's a notion of craft origins starting from something small. Um, another way that this whole uh, utopian vision, which I began by introducing as to do with the senses, the ear, the eye, back to the ear, um, also reaches new heights in some of the writings about robotics. So Hans Morovich, for example, uh, in his book Mind Children, talks about how what we're heading towards is this new super civilization where we'll be able to take the code which is our body, all these various patterns which we understand through DNA and so on, th that can all be coded into computer eventually. And so you have this vast network around the planet uh, in which are placed all our <coughs> codes. So human life can be somehow put into computer form. Um, and then one day this vast data sphere or this huge bubble uh, will be floating through space and collide with other uh, like um, um, beings, these m mega beings. Um, so you have this vision, which for some is very exciting, others absolutely appalling, and for others ludicrous, of, of, of some sort of absorption in a new unity, a whole. Um, so it's, it's again playing into this uh, utopian uh, vision, somewhat uh, less um, tangible than, than McLuhan's. Now I guess this in a way is the essence of romanticism. It's, it's a notion of the whole versus the parts. Um, we can see it in, in McLuhan's story, uh, getting back to a, a holistic state where all was one, uh, and then that contrasts with the period in which there was individuation and separation. Now just looking back at the basic uh, romantic literature of uh, Schlegel and, and others, we see that same sort of story, um, as well as uh, the valorization of notions of genius, um, of, of uh, the, the creative human spirit needing to be unleashed, as well as a return to childhood and the, the standard platforms of, of romanticism. There's also this incredibly strong thread that all of this is in, uh, encouraging us or helping us get back to some sort of unity. And what was wrong with rationalism and Descartes' project was that it was individuating, it was breaking things up. So for the romantic, we have to reconstruct the whole. Let's get back to some, to some whole. So we have the, the story of the adjustment of the sensorium. Somehow the ear and the eye are implicated in this narrative that involves a tension between uh, the parts and the whole. And for the romantic imagination, it's a case of getting back to the whole. And I'd argue we see that within many of the narratives that are constructed around information technology. Now this whole um, narrative of the part and the whole, of getting back to something, 
um, from this fallen state where things are individuated. If we speed, that, speed up that process, we have a kind of a repetition. If we're constantly trying to get back to the whole from this position of individuation, um, we have a kind of an obsessive uh, repetition um, where, um, well, in fact, perhaps the best way to introduce it is, is through Freud's notion of, of, of the Fort Dark game. So uh, his nephew um, was a, uh, engaged in this obsessive task sitting in his cot of, of throwing a cotton reel to which was uh, attached a piece of cord, throwing the cotton reel out of the, of the cot and then pulling it back in again, again and then throwing it out and then pulling it back in again. A kind of an obsessive, repetitive movement. Now for Freud, that was in fact uh, a reenacting of the trauma of the child having to uh, do without the mother. Now of course for Freud's narratives, uh, the mother in this sense reflects some notion of wholeness, of of, of oneness, so there's the, 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 the womb of the mother, there's some uh, wonderful state at which we're, we're in unity with ourselves and, and with, with our mother. It's a state of omnipotence, uh, a state of, um, of, of peace and, and wholeness and so on. Uh, and then for the child, to see the mother leave the room is traumatic because that somehow represented for the child uh, individuation, breaking away from this, this wholeness. And so the, the child would enact and reenact this process of throwing away and, and drawing back. So that sort of utopian narrative of the whole and the individuation, the whole and the parts, and that kind of tension, and I guess my pacing up and down is a, is a, a, a kind of manifestation of that. When nervous, we do the darndest things, like repeat ourselves and do that all the time, or pace. And likewise with the child throwing out the, the, the cotton reel. It's, it's an obsessive move. Um, so we can actually relate this notion of re repetition um, with obsession, uh, and we can relate that back to this uh, utopian story. So there is a, a sense in which, from a Freudian reading, a straight Freudian reading, um, the IT narratives are somehow implicated in this, this obsession. Now, for Freud, this all got caught up in the notion of the uncanny. So um, it's interesting that one often thinks of computers as somehow unsettling, uncanny, unhomely, in that they perhaps suggest to us uh, human agency. So the computer at times seems to be like, for Freud, a doll. I mean, we talk about computers, we talk about dolls, mechanical dolls and so on. And, and that often strikes as uncanny because we see an inanimate object as somehow alive. Uh, but Freud says, well, frankly, we're, we're used to that. Uh, we know about dolls and, and children are very imaginative and they think of anything being alive. So that's not the essence of uncanniness. Um, what strikes as uncanny is instances of repetition. So repetition almost per se, there are many interpretations of this, but it could be construed as, as uncanniness. So um, when, we s when something strikes us as unlikely, if there's a repetition, so in Freud's case, if the number on, the the on, on our seat ticket in the theatre happens to coincide with the same number as the seat on the train, uh, that's a repetition of an event, and that strikes us as, as, un as uncanny uh, for Freud because it's, it's reinvoking the trauma of, of, of loss from, from, from the mother. So this sort of recognition of a repetition um, is inv invoking, evoking some uh, sort of obsession. Now that's a kind of a psychologistic Freudian or neo-Freudian uh, take on repetition. So in the case of computing, um, what may strike as uncanny, what's disconcerting about using the computer is not that um, it seems to talk back to us or seems to be a person, but it actually invokes, requires us to repeat. It's not that the computer repeats things, but we repeat. And don't we get annoyed at having to constantly reformat paragraphs, especially with the new Microsoft Word, which seems to have a mind of its own, and t constantly taking out bullet points or whatever. You find yourself working through a document, and it's incredibly annoying, but also perhaps it's uncanny because it's requiring us to repeat. Uh, and by this reading, the necessity to constantly repeat uh, reminds us of, of child childhood traumas. Now, th that's a straw man to some extent that I've set up there. Um, but nonetheless, it is a kind of a Freudian reading of a way of looking at this utopian story, this 
constant need to get back to some notion of a whole. Um, if we scale that down to the constant repetition, we find that uh, uh, that I invokes the, the uh, utopian um, narrative yet again. But of course there are alternative stories about what, what repetition is all about. If you take repetition as something that's somehow key within our operations on the computer, um, we can also look to Foucault, for example, to see what he says about repetition. And here, perhaps it brings us back more directly to the notions of the body. That um, for Foucault, the issue seems to be um, what sort of disciplinary practices have we set up to render the body docile? So whereas a conventional, perhaps empiricist theorist might say that um, what's interesting in the developments of the last few hundred years um, in terms of law and order and rule and society is how the mind has been subjugated somehow. Uh, for Foucault, it all seems to be about the body, how the body has been subjugate, subjugated. But not subjugated to some agency, it's rather some collaborative enterprise by which we have agreed or decided or let happen, some rendering of our bodies docile in some way. And so for, for Foucault, um, there are these narratives that talk about um, certain epochs in which the body was given certain scope and latitude to do certain things but then of course through the enlightenment uh, we have epochs wherein uh, the body has to perform or conform so um, certainly uh, there's a notion of uh, disciplinary practice in school students sitting in the classroom with the upright posture that there are exercises and drills that one has to carry out uh, to discipline the body even handwriting is somehow implicated posture, gymnastics and so on. So the repetitions of the body are a means of um, uh, by which we, we subjugate the body, we render it docile as a community and uh, that of course is, is, is a narrative that leaves to one side the issue of, of mind. Now I guess if one takes a Foucauldian view of, of the issue of repetition uh, and applies that to computing it constructs some interesting, perhaps new narratives. Now, I don't know what the order of these, but uh, if we just think about, um, I'll come back to some of these images in a minute, and the plug. Uh, this is about repetition, perhaps. Uh, if, um, yes, if, if we're thinking about well, I should say what one of the applications of Foucault to information technology has generally been to focus on the issue of the panopticon. panopticon. So, of course, Foucault took ben Benjamin's uh, um, uh, Bentham, sorry, his, his plan form for a prison and so on, and said, well, here you've got this notion of surveillance and, and, and so on. Well, there is a narrative that's, that's been constructed and even distorted to do with uh, the panopticon. Uh, and the computer, so we're constantly under surveillance. Well, I, I contend that's, that's only part of the story. There's other things going on to do with disciplinary practice and the body. So one, I haven't done this, and I don't know anybody who's done it yet, one could actually write a history of the disciplinary practice of working with the computer, which is, would no doubt, if someone was rigorous about this, implicate various phases of development of the computer which implicate the body. So the use of punch cards, for example, um, certainly the way that was manifest in universities. Students and others would sit in cafeterias and libraries punching holes in bits of card. That was a whole kind of bodily comportment um, that was somewhat different than the way one interacts with the computer now. Uh, then of course we had punch tapes and also we had keyboards which were very noisy and you had to work somewhat in isolation um, um, as you pounded away at, the, at these keys. So that was a particular bodily comportment and attitude as one worked with computers. Then of course with the invention of the visual display unit uh, another kind of interaction uh, comes into play uh, and you have the notion of the ergonomically wise data entry clerk I suppose and, and all sorts of ergonomic notions about how you should sit and uh, comport yourself uh, in front of these computers. Now that's a kind of a disciplinary practice um, but of course other technologies have gone in different directions and, and one could say, well, isn't there an inevitability about the way that the body has been handled and managed and comported in relation to computers? Well, I think a Foucauldian reading would suggest not. All sorts of choices and decisions have been made, um, and, and the computer could have been developed in various directions. It would Im implicate the body in different ways. So, for example, um, one can find any number of these pictures on the web. The, the whole issue of what's been known as ubiquitous computing, which um, is 
these ideas developed at uh, Park Xerox, where uh, we expect computers to be lying around everywhere. And uh, there are pictures, I don't know if we get them on the left here or not, but uh, pictures of executives and I guess you may be academics sitting around with these uh, liquid crystal displays on their laps or sitting on tabletops. They're sort of everywhere. They're strewn around the place. And there's some notion of the egalitarian <coughs> office. And the posture that accompanies that is one of casual, casual informality. And of course, ideas of small devices which you can gather around <coughs> and so on. So the way we're using computers, the way we're inventing computers, seem to implicate the body in different ways. And then if we move into the, uh, the romantic and utopian visions, um, we find that there are notions of, of uh, the human body in virtual reality, usually flying, perhaps, and that's often how the body is depicted in VR, science fiction, and so on. Um, or the body as the Vitruvian man with arms outstretched, um, not lying on his back, but somewhat heroically, um, making declarations, uh, a sense of freedom and release. Uh, but also one could contrast that iconography with the way the body actually does succumb when it's placed, when a headset is placed over it. Um, in fact, the body tends to have to um, shoulder the burden of this technology, but of course what's going on in the virtual world is some notion of, of stretching out. So anyway, th it's clear to me that the body is implicated in these various technologies uh, and the way the computer system has be been developed. And from a Foucauldian reading, that produces a different reading than, than, a, than a Freudian reading. Um, but there is another reading again, and that is the notion of uh, the hermeneutical. Um, Freud's notion of the game um, suggests that the essence of a game is repetition. So the young child obsessively repeating this action uh, is what constitutes a game. It's all about repetition. And certainly a superficial observation of, of gaming would suggest that that's, that's important. Um, but for hermeneutical writers such as Hans Georg Gadamer, who I cite frequently in the book and in a way provides a philosophical underpinning for the book, um, would suggest that really the essence of a game is the variation. So um, sure, a game player, such as a child throwing a cotton reel around, may be repeating, uh, obsessively even, but uh, surely it's, it's the variation, it's the subtle difference, it's how when the cotton reel is thrown away, bringing it back, uh, it seems to be somewhat transformed. Either the cotton reel is transformed, or the uh, context is transformed, or the mood, one's mood is transformed. Uh, but there are constant transformations, variations in these repetitions. Now for a hermeneut a her hermeneutical writer, that's the essence of, uh, of interpretation. That's the, the way game playing works. Um, this constant to and fro movement where things are happening over and over again, but each reading is a new reading, albeit no doubt often a very subtle rereading. And in fact that's one of the stories of hermeneutics, that there is this play between the whole and the parts. Um, rather than just a repetition, we're constantly trying to come to terms with the whole of a context or the whole of a text and the minuti minuti of its parts. And there is this play of the whole and the parts. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to cover um, the grounding of, of, of these ideas in, in this short talk, but it's just to alert us that there are different views of, of what repetition might mean. There's the Foucauldian view, which implicates notions of disciplinary practice, and I think that leads in a certain direction of inquiry regarding computers. Then there's a the hermeneutical view, which again leads in, uh, in other directions. Now, once we do move into a hermeneutical construction of... Uh, of interpretation, <coughs> of the repetitive process, or the utopian narrative, in fact. Um, that suggests a third point for us, and that is that when we're projecting, when we're looking towards the future, as in McLuhan's romantic narrative, we're looking ahead to something new, um, there is the suggestion there that we're actually facing something. One could actually look at that in bodily terms. Behind us is some legacy. We're in the present, which is not necessarily desirable, and then we're looking forward to some new state. So there is the whole notion of orientation and comportment and attitude. And again, following from some of the sources of hermeneutical writers, such as uh, Heidegger and so on, the issue of attitude, bodily comportment, or rather comportment, orientation, uh, becomes very important. And so I think um, th that brings me to the third main point, which is that the body 
uh, is implicated in issues to do with architecture and information technology through the issue of attitude. Now, attitude clearly has uh, various meanings, one of which is, well, if someone says, do you watch your attitude towards computers? That might mean you have a mindset uh, towards computers, but it could also mean what's your bodily comportment towards computers. Now, wh one of the things we explored in one of the studios was the issue of the body in relation to IT and computing, uh, IT and architecture. And um, one soon finds, of course, working with students and designers generally, there is a propensity towards uh, romantic notions of how architecture intervenes uh, in the aesthetic realm, really, uh, that we tend to think perhaps that uh, as we build architecture that somehow we're creating something that might elevate the spirit, that might impinge on the soul, uh, that might bring us into some sort of sense of wholeness, um, that architecture might have this transformative power on the inner life. And that constitutes a fairly substantial aesthetic theory, albeit a very simple aesthetic theory, that uh, the value of architecture as an aesthetic pursuit is that it transforms the, the inner life, a subjectivist sort of view. Um, but if we just pragmatically try and talk about architecture without those sorts of references, without the romantic subjectivist references, but think of it in terms of the body, um, that I think constitutes an interesting set of transformations in its own right. Um, rather than talking about inspirational architecture uh, or lifting the spirit, uh, we could ask how is the body implicated in the design, um, conception, history and engagement uh, with this particular space. So what does this space do to the body or what does this body even do to the space? And as I say, we pursued that as a, as a theme in one of the studios or rather emerged as one of the themes. This is some work from a couple of years ago uh, which <laughs> allowed us to explore many issues to do with computing or at least a, a lot of emerged from it as a, as a kind of a research exercise in its own right. I must say one of them was the issue of the uncanny and I, uh, I was intrigued by this image where the students put themselves in the picture um, and uh, that one can also construct a story about the, un the uncanny from a Freudian perspective in that where we see ourselves or place ourselves in the picture. Um, also, this seemed to me to highlight all sorts of issues to do with the surreal, which um, we don't have time to go into now, perhaps. Um, another project we looked at was, um, or at least a precursor to, to a, a major design exercise, was to take some elements around the site and to model them in three dimensions in a fairly conventional sort of way, I guess. Think about how you might represent uh, these objects. But then also think about how you could deny their usual relationship with the body. So it's not a full set, but for example, oh well, th there's the lighthouse, which is ordinarily to protect, <coughs> and somehow uh, it's a, an, it involves some notion of harboring and, and protection. But then the student elected to uh, abrogate its ordinary relationship with the body by showing it as something that's uh, dangerous rather than safe. And then a winch that's meant to somehow be a labour-saving device was rendered something that would in fact be a, a more like a treadmill that would in induce labour rather than um, than uh, save it. Um, so there are ways here of, of exploring design ideas by taking an object in its relationship with the body and somehow uh, denying that. And so in this case, this uh, article of, of war, which is now a touristic sort of object, uh, but very inert and lifeless, uh, seeing what, that, what it would mean to give life to that object, uh, render it full of life. And then issues to do with... Um, uh, the, the design of a building that m may invoke, uh, well, certainly the body, the body was involved in all this. Uh, what the students were designing here was a, a, a museum of body technologies, so the various new emerging technologies to do with genetics and nanotechnology and so on were to be somehow housed and displayed in this museum. It's just interesting to see how the issue of the body, especially as one reflects on the relationship between the body and the computer, how that informed the designs. And certainly in the narratives the students were constructing, there were notions of uh, buildings that somehow open up that are warm buildings uh, as opposed to cool buildings which uh, somehow contract and close in on themselves. Um, and there are buildings that are in repose uh, and so on. So certainly th the metaphors of the body uh, seem to be very rich uh, when one looks at them in, a, in, a, in the context of, of design. Now more lately, oh actually might as well just look at this, this was a student looking at putative uh, virtual reality environment. Uh, initially they created uh, a space which is somewhat open and it was meant to be some representation or understanding of 
the infinity of data as it sort of spreads and so on. So you have a scaffolding, and the, uh, the scaffold, scaffolding expands as, as knowledge and data expand, uh, which suggested so a space that was somewhat uh, vertiginous and, and open, um, and, and no doubt not particularly friendly, but by virtue of the fact that one feels very fragile in it. But then that induced the students to think about uh, the reverse of that, which is a closed in, highly mechanical space where knowledge is somehow accreted inwardly rather than outwardly, but in its own right it would be dangerous somehow. And the students characterize this as an agrophobic space and a, an introverted kind of space. So there was some sort of tension in their design was developed and emerged through the tension between those sorts of spaces. And I guess it's just interesting to reflect that, in fact, these do implicate the body and bodily postures. Uh, that one may cower on the, one of the ledges of that scaffolding. That's a bodily position. Here one may try and break out. That's a further bodily position. Um, so th that's the issue of attitude, um, that one can look at architecture from the point of view of uh, how it impinges on uh, the body and how the body is implicated in its creation and construction. And of course, when s one starts using the computer, uh, that comes to fruition in, in new ways again. Um, these are just some slides about a very prosaic computer program which we're developing to do with exploring uh, product information on the World Wide Web. But it's just interesting in, in, in this case perhaps to think how also the body is implicated, at least through various metaphors, in even a prosaic uh, entity like this. We have notions of windows where you peer into different environments. There's some notion of picking up materials and holding them or grabbing them. Um, maybe run out of slides of that. Uh, so even the most prosaic computer exercise or research program can be seen somehow to implicate the body, um, and that might be a productive avenue to explore. Okay, the other thing we looked at last year was um, this taking to task um, McLuhan's notion of the sensorium and uh, his idea that we're somehow returning to the oral sense um, and, and we're the better for it. Uh, just taking that as a, as a quite powerful narrative and seeing what one can do with it. But in this case, we collaborated with some um, teachers from the music faculty University, and um, they're very much into contemporary music and sound and uh, what they call soundscapes. So it's an exploration of the sound of various sites. So here we were looking at a stretch of beautiful coastline just east of Edinburgh, and uh, we had an exercise where the students went out to the site and had to identify a particular sound, so the sound of splashing water or uh, water dripping off a cliff face or whatever, and then the exercise on this particular day was to construct some sort of sculpture, a sound sculpture or a model that, that had something to say or responded to that, uh, that sound source. Uh, then students were involved in constructing um, a sound pavilion, which was uh, actually initially a sound sculpture electronically on a computer. Now, I don't show this because it's particularly uh, spectacular in quality. Um, but there is some 32-bit sound here, which was put together by one of the musicians, uh, a, a collage of sounds from the, uh, from the site, which the students have collected. And as I say, it was a student's exercise to create a sound sculpture. So it's a kind of an interpretation of the sound, the first exercise in, in 3D modeling. It's safe to go around the corner in about half an hour. 
which it doesn't come across in that uh, sound bite, but um, I think that's the end of the sound. The um, uh, next year when we run the same sort of project again, we'll go to a more industrial site because we found that the whole um, sonic landscape was dominated by the sound of waves, which is interesting in its own right, but um, we missed a lot of subtleties through that, I guess. So just to conclude, what, what I've hoped I've try, uh, been able to show is that there is a kind of a, an interesting trilogy one can construct here about architecture, about the body, uh, and about computing, IT. Um, and I've done it by looking at uh, the notion of a sensorium as McLuhan constructs it, this idea of a transformation to do with uh, the ear and the eye. And that, of course, implicates utopian notions, which are thoroughly romantic, uh, that implicate notions of the whole and getting back to the whole, the one. Um, and then that somehow implicates the notion of repetition, if you speed up this sort of quest to get back to wholeness. And that fits within a, a Freudian narrative of, of, again, the whole, the one of the mother, and somehow being denied or distanced from that. Uh, that whole story about repetition, which recurs throughout uh, contemporary philosophy, and of course Deleuze and others have picked up on the issue of repetition. Um, and then finally, it was the whole issue of attitude, because I guess one could say the whole <coughs> utopian project of looking forward, projecting to some wonderful future, a digital future, um, an utopia even, um, is, is somehow driven um, by this, uh, this same, um, same sort of view, this quest to get back to a whole or a one. But then the way out of it, I think, is to look critically at, um, at uh, well, all of these notions, but I guess it, it's phenomenology and it's hermeneutics uh, that, that help us get out of this by constructing the story of the part and the whole in a particular way, which we don't have time to go into detail here. And I guess also I noticed in the um, short uh, introduction to this, uh, to this uh, talk that I said I'd talk about Lacan. Well, I think Lacan obviously provides yet another way of, of moving out of this techno-romanticism, uh, and that involves uh, appropriating some notion of rupture and breach um, and in, in this quest to get back to a whole or a, or a, a unity that uh, already the real is, is fraught with some kind of rift and, and separation, that that is the human condition. Um, so that's a whole other line of, of discussion one could pursue to, to help move us away from techno-romanticism. So I hope that uh, clarifies my position, and uh <laughs> I'll throw the meeting open to questions. Okay, well, we have some time uh, for questions. Um, maybe I could start by kind of asking about really the status of the last few remarks. Um, you know, on the one hand, you're indicating that the kind of narratives or the impulses of techno romanticism. Um, while technically novel always lead to a kind of traditional uh, idealization of the whole. I mean, you know, in, th in that sense, you could almost, in a way, have, have used also Derrida um, to indicate in a kind of blunt fashion that, that that wish for the totality, whether at the level of the concept or indeed at the level of experience, um, has always already been a part of kind of European techno-romanticism. That in that sense, techno-romanticism has nothing to do uh, with the computer is simply been uh, a kind of tendency within thought towards what Freud would call kind of idealization. Um, so I suppose my question in a way is kind of um, is there a difference between the techno-romanticism of Western culture and 
the moment when it becomes articulated to the computer. If you see what I mean. Yes, I mean, it seems yes. to me you do an extremely good technical job of referring back certain fantasies uh, within the world of the computer to very traditional fantasies. Um, are there nonetheless kind of some new ones or, or some reconfigurations of that kind of romanticism within the computer? Well, I guess by definition there wouldn't be reconfigure <laughs> operating as a kind of a structuralist. What one might be looking for these commonalities, and uh, of course, if you look, you find them. Um, I, I don't. I guess the arguments I've been using, th there's very prosaic arguments, which, which is to say, well, just look at the evidence, look at these narratives, and you can see this. You can see how romanticism is there in them, um, and that's quite an easy job, I think. And other people have done that as well. Um, the other thing one can do is look historically at, at, what, at, at the course of Romanticism. And as many commentators have said, well, Romanticism never died. We are very much a Romantic age. Every other philosophical movement has sort of had a, an end point or, or whatever. Rationalism, you could say, died at some point or other. But Romanticism seems to have thrived. And of course, where does it thrive? Well, um, in the mass media and in popular, so-called popular culture in Hollywood, and elsewhere, um, it's very difficult to identify a contemporary uh, m science fiction movie that doesn't somehow buy into um, a great deal of romanticism. But then, of course, romanticism has taken di different courses, and the surrealists um, were quite happy to align themselves with romanticism, but they did it in a, in a new sort of way. Uh, they were somewhat critical, and they've uh, produced another kind of narrative which uh, is, is born from romanticism. I guess the hermeneutical tradition also buys into Schlegel and Schelling and, and um, 18th, 17th century, 19th century uh, romantic writers. Um, so there has been a transformation of romanticism. I guess the other sets of narratives that one sees that I haven't really alluded to are, um, I guess, IT narratives that do buy into um, Lacan and uh, post-structuralism. I guess uh, I've put in that category uh, writers such as um, um, woman who wrote about the cyborg. Thank you. Um, um, Donna, Haraway. Donna Haraway, yes. Uh, perhaps without herself recognizing it, but there is something in that narrative about the cyborg which suggests that you know, already our being is somehow fraught, uh, that you know, we're radical at the core. Um, and I think that kind of narrative is very interesting and it's being exacerbated and promoted through, through the use of the computer. Uh, and it's somewhat at variance with a kind of a romantic narrative. That doesn't answer your question, but anyway. I mean, perhaps, well, inside, perhaps, one, perhaps one could sort of press it kind of a bit further. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, like, in your argument, in a sense, uh, the weight of critical thought is somehow against the fantasies mm. which uh, kind of optimistic or idealizing computerizational thought kind of generates. And, and, and I think, you know, that it, it's quite rare uh, and valuable uh, for someone to sustain that kind of position, especially when elements of that critical thought, uh, need one mention people like Deleuze, etc. cetera, uh, are kind of utilized as almost already kind of available to be computed. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it seems to me that, that somehow uh, uh, even, even if you discarded the idealizing and romanticist element of pro-computerization, um, kind of how does it still stand with those aspects of people's kind of Deleuzean thought, uh, which makes it sort of prone to the wish to computerize it? Sorry, I mean, that's a, an extremely kind of... Well, as you know... There, there are various people who could put it better than me. 
Um, well, as we know, hi hypertext, if we listen to Sherry Turkle, hypertext and the World Wide Web and so on, they operationalize postmodern thought, don't they? Um, they? They show us that the referent is constantly uh, in, in, in train, um, that uh, there is no, sorry, there's no ultimate referent, but a, a series of references to references, that uh, IT renders tangible the postmodern project. But that, and sorry. that implicates Derrida. I don't believe that for a minute. No, right, <laughs> because that argument has been around in a way ever since Plato commented on the introduction on writing. Yes. I mean, and indeed, you know, nothing would more engender caution than treating all these arguments as a replay uh, of the arguments in classical antiquity about the introduction of writing. Mm. Well, quite, um, yes. Yes, I make that reference in the book. It's interesting in the case, I guess in the case of many people who think they're appropriating, uh, well, Derrida perhaps and, and Deleuze, uh, and, and Lacan for that matter. So, for example, Sherry Turkle, who, who is a Lacanian scholar, she, she's translated some of his work and so on in the past, but uh, the, the kind of narrative she constructs is that um, with MUDs and, uh, and uh, the internet and so on, uh, identity is being fragmented uh, you can't get back to the real person and, and this information technology is demonstrating that for us. But it's the job of information technology uh, or ourselves using it to reintegrate ourselves, to find new configurations of identity in it. Now to me that sort of notion is totally counter to any idea that Deleuze would have put forward in schizophrenia and suspicion or whatever, whatever it is, the, uh, the, the notion of um, you know, smashing uh, the Oedipus myth and, and, and so on, ideas of rupture. Um, so in other words, deep within the, uh, dare I say it, the American uh, 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 writing uh, community, people writing about IT, is this sort of ego psychology which um, is, is well, quite dominant. It's all about reintegrating ourselves to be whole. So any kind of post-structuralist uh, narrative gets reconfigured and turned into, again, a romantic narrative about reconfiguring the self, uh, becoming whole, being real people. Um. Okay, uh, there, there are a number of people. Uh, oh dear. I've got, I've got a little one. <coughs> okay. No, but yours doesn't speak. <laughs> okay, perhaps I, in in, perhaps I shouldn't sort of continue this debate, but just sort of start from another angle and perhaps that might sort of help it. Why don't you uh, turn it off? Yeah. What I wanted to ask uh, is something quite specific and it's related to the part when you talk about the body. Yep. Uh, because what in a way uh, has appeared wha uh, when you started talking about McLuhan and his kind of criticism of the visual through writing and so on and so forth as kind of dominant within the Western culture, you were almost uh, you were revoking that perhaps other parts of human body were, as it were, because of that, kind of repre repressed or put aside or sort of not used as a kind of, uh, uh, as to that extent, uh, for any kind of uh, purposes of, of, of recalling the experiences that might sort of work towards knowledge and so on and so forth. So in a way, you have sort of picked up that critique of the visual, and um, then you sort of, a position that as part of the kind of general interest of the body. You recalled Foucault and sort of mentioned that perhaps other kind of things that kind of relate to the body have been also repressed. And, and then uh, you were saying, you know, what is going on with the body in relation to computer. And it seems to me that I kind of missed the part, and perhaps it's just because you had to go quickly through your presentation, and perhaps that's in the book, but if you could elaborate a bit more. Uh, you talked about the postures and then you sort of mentioned that that was part of your investigation when you were showing some of the spaces. And it didn't sort of come quite clear to me, uh, what have you done in this respect? How did you call uh, and how did you map down or did you map down any of these kind of experiences of the body through the space, i.e. postures and other things uh, that perhaps could be, as it were, recorded by the body? Did you sort of work on well that no, we level? Didn't. No, I mean, you know, it's like running a studio project. You can go in any direction. Right. I, I guess the things that I learned from the project, um, from the students, and of course one's just interaction with the, the issues. But I guess, no, uh, there are many things one could do, but uh, I think 
my, one of my other themes is metaphor. And clearly, I guess one could say, well, the body is appearing as a metaphor in these various designs. Um, notions of prosthetics, for example, which was to be one of the exhibits in the museum, that seemed to emerge in some of the architecture. The way, I mean, one has to see the architecture or the designs in the context of students' narratives as they talk mm. about them. And certainly yeah. there'd be notions of extensions to buildings, and they're somewhat analogous to extensions to limbs and arms and things. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry that I sort of raised that. The reason why I'm raising it, because you sort of mentioned the agoraphobia at one yes, point. Yes. And I, I was just kind of wondering, how was that reconstructed from this kind of um, discussion about the body or whatever? Because I just couldn't sort of see that. Yes. That was uh, the well reason. Uh, I mean, it's a simple story, perhaps. As the students were working on that large scaffold, scaffolding type space, uh, the students were saying, you know, and what we wanted, if only we had animation. We didn't have an animation package at that stage. But wouldn't it be great to fly through this because that's, you know, what the space suggests. But then I think I might have said to them, well, is it really the sort of space you'd want to fly through? Wouldn't you really want to curl up on one of the edges of these things to be holding on for grim death because you're, you're, you're dead frightened of the whole experience? So th that does then relate it to a kind of a bodily position. But that, that, that relates to, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, one of the most interesting contributions Freud, it seems to me, to, to, to this issue is that if you try and ask the global question, kind of do fundamental technological changes um, change the sensorium or not? I mean, one could stop for a moment and ask, well, you know, what, I mean, it still seems to me that when one is trying to digest the consequences of computerization in IT, it's still worth thinking about the introduction of the telephone. Because, I mean, at one level, this seems to me, you know, one of the most remarkable technological interventions. Now, in the debate about the introduction of the telephone, some people kind of held the notion that actually it would totally transform culture. A.B. Warburg uh, was an enthusiast for a view that it would simply end civilization. Insofar as civilization was an increasing distanciation between the subject and object. Insofar as the telephone suddenly brought the object remarkably close to the subject. The whole of kind of civilization would collapse with the spread, I mean, collapse into a kind of psychosis because of the introduction of the telephone. Now, it seems to me that, that one of the things that Freud introduces, um, which is very useful in the analysis of the introduction and the dissemination of technology, is the notion of the splitting of the ego. The idea that the subject is both taken in by the technology and is not taken in by the technology. So that, you know, something like the mobile phone does produce a transformation of kind of relations, but as it were, only in part. And there's another part which simply always regards this as something like mere convenience. You know, so on the one hand, you have something introduced which threatens you with psychosis. But there's another part that resists it by saying, well, you know, maybe, but it's quite useful. Uh, and this combination of the split in the ego seems to be characteristic of human responses, which makes it very difficult for like a historian or an analyst of technology to say anything kind of definitive. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the case. Um, but, but early on in your, your comments there, you were suggesting that we need to know what's really going on. And I think probably one reason why I've cottoned onto the notion of narrative is that we don't need to worry about empirically what is the case. That's less interesting from the point of view of my, my book than simply the fact that we construct these narratives. So I mean, there is the empirical question, I suppose. Is the future going to be better thanks to IT or not? <coughs> um, well, obviously, I mean, empirically one could say yes, better for some and not for others, and yeah. better in some respects and not others, and things certainly are going to change. But of course, implicated in that whole issue of what's happening 
is are these narratives that we construct? And uh, I guess that's the focus. I was drawing back from the issue of, you know, are these things really going to happen? Is it really going to be the case? Is the eye really dominant over the ear? And so on. I mean, that's another set of questions. Uh, as I say, what, what I think is more interesting at the moment is just the fact that we, without question, construct these various narratives and they have power and potency and there's a whole publishing industry built around them, uh, quite apart from the computer industry. Are there any other comments? Sorry. We can ah. do that. Okay. Um, it seems to me that when Heidegger talks about orientation, he always presupposes that man is involved with the world, and this world, man somehow does not fully control. I mean, he's, it's to a certain extent controlling him. It's not a totality that is according to his design. Yes. Um, you also talked about that this involvement, the possibility for involvement with IT is very often an impoverished one. And that impoverishment seems partly to have to do with the fact that you have to construct these worlds yourself. And I was quite interested in how you square the Heideggerian sort of notion of involvement uh, yes. with the world and the possibility for involvement that you confront with a medium yes. like this. Yeah, there's a line in, in, in the book ab about that, meaning a, a thread. And uh, it's interesting, the, the issue of Heidegger and the body, because Heidegger's not big on the body. And, of course, he, he points to a notion of orientation as being some primordial condition that is uh, irrespective of the notion of a body, that the idea of a body comes later. So I, I, I wasn't entirely, I mean, one can't do justice to these people in a few sentences. Um, so that's one point. Uh, the other is this whole issue of engagement and involvement. I guess... Uh, what I pick up from that is that, well, yes, always we're engaged and we're involved in practices. And so our involvement with the computer is at a practical level. So what, what Heidegger enjoins us to do, I think, is to engage with the day-to-day -day use of these technologies. So, for example, if, there's a, if people are constructing, suppose, virtual worlds with head that require headsets to, to experience and so on, then the experience of the headset uh, is part of the, or the, the practice and engagement with the headset and that technology around us is part of the whole process. What tends to happen in the techno-romantic literature is there's a, people tend to ignore the, the practicalities of using all this stuff. It's all in some ideal realm, this sort of utopia or whatever, of, of, of the future and elsewhere. But I think what Heidegger enjoins us to do is to in the same way that he says well, the carpenter working with a hammer is engaged with the tool of the hammer and so on. Likewise, the computer hacker, or whatever, is there sitting, um, as Foucault, Foucauldian reading would suggest, with a body, using all this equipment in front of them. And sometimes it fails and breaks down. Likewise, with this headset, you're staring at the, the screen and you get tired after, t uh, after a while and the, there's low resolution and, and the headset starts to drop off and, and you, you, you see... <laughs> you hear other people in the museum or if it's a, an exhibition or whatever. So all of that's part of the, ex of the engagement and the, and the practice of using the technology. And I think that's what Heidegger points to, a sort of pragmatic engagement at every level with the technology. I, I actually... Well, I think so. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say something. I didn't actually... Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I had actually a, a, a couple of thoughts, which I'm not sure they um, quite organize themselves into a question, but I was thinking about the kind of environments. I was thinking about different kinds of environments, some of which you've presented here, some that you've just alluded to, and uh, particularly those which are probably most problematic in terms of their relationship to the body. And, and the ones that I, I think of are um, the kind of environment you're in when you are um, kind of, when you're cruising the internet and sort of clicking from website to website, which involves a certain kind of repetition. Um, another one which might be 
quite different from it is our, our sound environment, some of which you had an example of here, which usually, I don't speak with tremendous knowledge of, of sound environments, but the ones that I'm familiar with, they usually also involve some kind of repetition, I think primarily because it's a lot of times it's electronic um, uh, generated music and using rhythm and, 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 and things like that. Um, and, but I'm thinking that, that actually these are two examples which are very problematic in terms of how they relate to or accommodate the body. I mean, much more so, quite frankly, than, than um, the kinds of examples that you've given which were primarily about the disciplining the body. Obviously, as soon as we get to disciplining the body, there's certain specific physical relationships which you don't have, I, I, I think, with um, internet cruising. And, and I think with that case you don't have it because it's a little bit like um, the kind of labyrinth environment except without Ariadne's thread. It's this kind of, um, it, or, or alternatively it's, it's without narrative. Um, there's kind of obsession and there's certain kind of goal-driven behavior involved in it, but it's <coughs> without narrative and usually without the possibility of, of returning. And, and I, I just, I, I wonder if you can say something about that because, I mean, that's I think what you started with. You were really starting with, well, you know, where is the body in this? And it seems those are two problematic environments. I, I just wonder if yeah. there are comments that you have on that. It's not really a question. Well, you raise lots of interesting issues. Yeah. I think the issue of, uh, you know, where is the body? Uh, I hope I've made clear that I'm, I'm not saying we need to get the body back into these environments. Advocating that they're impoverished, as far as the body's concerned, they just they in, in set us off on, on new modes of, of practice that implicate the body in different ways than we're used to, perhaps. But it's I'm not interested in a, a lament about or a, pro, a, a recognition of a problem about the body. And I think then you raise the issue of uh, narrative. There's a whole sort of new narrative about narrative that's emerging. Um, recently, I read Hamlet on the holodeck. For example, and one can't keep up with this vast literature that's coming out, but, but in that one, sure enough, one can see this whole new meta-narrative being constructed that really what narrative is all about is disconnection and options and being immersed in a story. And of course, the World Wide Web and, and uh, putative uh, um, environments, virtual environments and so on, provide this opportunity to act out a story and to be part of a whole thing. But also by the same token, you don't know where it's heading uh, the characters can change roles and so on. But to me, that's also, <laughs> th there is a narrative being spun there, which is about some new sense of holistic engagement with the very notion of narrative itself, that narrative is, is a kind of a representation of what's out there in the world. Um, and uh, with these new media, we can free up that, uh, that narrative um, and, and enter into it in, in ways that are utterly absorbing and so on. Um, so there is a kind of a meta-narrative ab about narrative going on there. Um, I don't think ever we're away from narrative, sure, when surfing the net and so on. Uh, the form of, of what's happening is, is indeterminate, perhaps, but certainly within the um, mindset of, of the people who write about it and no doubt people who reflect on what's happening, there is this meta-narrative, namely, oh, well, I'm getting back to some kind of unity in this environment. I'm getting absorbed and involved in this... Uh, space, aren't I? And do you it's really somehow authentic. Do you really think that's what's happening with mm. getting back to a unity? Oh, do I think that? When you're clicking from, from um, you know, site to site. You know, like well, that's a kind of empirical question. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. And it doesn't, it doesn't particularly interest me whether we are or not. It's, it's the power of, of the narrative, that, that, you know, the implication that we are doing that. You know, we're getting back to our true selves. I don't want to overstate yeah, the case with people who write this. 
Well, I'd see it more as kind of, sort of game or diversion environment, which you move into from time to time, and then we move out of. And I think the getting in there and the getting out is, is as much a, um, a, a part of the experience as anything, you know. And that, to me, is a, a Heideggerian sort of reading. It's what happens between getting absorbed in this game or whatever the environment is, uh, as much as what's actually happening in there. It's logging on and logging off. It's the anticipation of, of some disorientation when you get there. It's, it's getting out of it and finding yourself in your familiar bedroom environment or wherever you've got your computer. So all of that's the experience. That's, that's the, the thing that we're all caught up in. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, let me just say that he will continue to answer questions at 10 a.m. <coughs> tomorrow morning um, in the North Jury Room uh, um, Gordana, you will be able to share it. Uh, so if, it. if you're able to kind of formulate questions, do come tomorrow morning. Um, it was extremely nice that you kind of came to talk about the second book uh, and to return to the AA. Thank you very much for doing so. Thank you. Is this off? <laughs> Testing, <laughs> testing. Uh,